Ransomware and Disaster Recovery um, with Elastic Disaster Recovery Service. Um, my name is Karen James. I'm a Partner Development Manager for Disaster Recovery and Resilience Services here at AWS. And I'm joined here today by my colleague Diego. Can you quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. I'm Diego Dalmolin. I'm Principal Solutions Architect in AWS, part of the Partner Resilience Team. Maybe we need your mic to go up a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Checking mic? Can you hear all me? Perfect. Oh, good. Thank you. It's actually my first lightning talk, so please be gentle, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, welcome. In this talk today, we'll remind ourselves of the impact of ransomware and how detrimental it can be to businesses of any size. And we'll do a brief refresher of the National Institutes of Standards and Technology Framework, also known as the NIST Framework. We'll segue into why disaster recovery on the cloud and the benefits of that. And then uh, we'll close out with an introduction to AWS Disaster Recovery Service, our native DR service on AWS. And I know there was a question around end-to-end -end DR, so we might not get to that today, but we are at a booth way back uh, by Theater One, so if you want to kind of find us, we can talk about all the options that we have. So, no doubt, everyone here is familiar with ransomware, but in short, it's a type of malware that prevents um, or limits users from accessing the system, either by locking um, the system screen altogether or simply um, locking the access to the user's file. Unauthorized users um, are exploiting uh, system vulnerabilities to access the data and then restrict the access, basically. And by the way, Paying the ransom doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get your data back. So when dealing with ransomware events, the data recovery ransom payments are just one element of the recovery costs. So excluding any ransoms paid globally, organizations reported an estimated mean cost to recover from ransomware attacks of 1.8 million. And that's an increase from the 2022 report figure of 1.4 million. The average size of a ransomware payment was 1.5 million, which almost twice as many corporations reported an incident in 2023 versus 2021. So if we were to think about what triggers organizations to be more susceptible than others when it comes to um, ransomware incidents, uh, there are three main categories that we've identified. So there's a technical aspect, customer issues such as the lack of the right set of skills or even adequate talent to deal with the problems of um, a cyber incident. Or even being heavily dependent on manual um, processes, patch management issues and so forth. Then of course there's the human element. The lack of awareness of amongst end users could result in the exposure to a cyber incident. I mean, how many times do we get an email to say, hey, click on my link and you get a million dollars, right? So, of course, um, the human element is not to be ignored. And thirdly, and probably most important, if an entity does not have a comprehensive security and resilience strategy, preparing for a ransomware attack holistically can prove incredibly difficult. And one of those holistic approaches or even prescriptive guidance in this space is NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology Framework. So in order to mitigate against the threats and impacts of ransomware and cyber, the framework um, assists in determining which activities are most important to assure critical operations and service delivery. So according to the framework, there are five pillars uh, that um, companies should adhere to to have a comprehensive cybersecurity uh, strategy to mitigate an attack. Whilst all of these five areas are equally important, what you address first determines how prepared you are to recover from an attack and how quickly you can get back to business as usual. Those five pillars are is the identification of what is really a critical asset or a function in your organization. Oops, sorry. Oops, sorry. I'm so sorry, I, I messed up. Uh, protection, um, he's making it more difficult for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, then 
the second pillar is protection. So what are those safeguards that you need to put in place to protect your critical infrastructure? Then the third one, detection, right? So it's implementing tools and services to identify the, identify the threats in the first place. Responding, defining the clear measures on how to actually react to a cyber event. Who in your organization needs to be notified? Who has to pull the first trigger to get the recovery started? And lastly, and most, um, most importantly, in my opinion, recover. So defining and implementing business continuity plans to restore and recover successfully during and after a cybersecurity event. And as a gentle reminder, an untested disaster recovery strategy is no disaster recovery strategy. And as I just mentioned, what you address first really determines the preparedness of your organization. So based on the framework, the first step is to identify which applications are important to the business by defining recovery objectives. Um, for each group of the applications. We are, as AWS, we offer a number of services that can help replicate data into AWS, giving you the ability to recover these workloads on AWS if necessary. And now that your data uh, sits safely in your AWS account, you can assign the resources required to address the NIST recommendations, protect, detect, and respond. The reason for a layered approach is while there is, 100%, there is no 100% way to eliminate the threat of ransomware, layering your cybersecurity stack will reduce the risk by um, adding resilience. So if one layer is penetrated, you will have additional layers of protection to prevent an incident. I'm now going to hand you over to Diego, who will dig a little bit deeper on why moving disaster recovery to the cloud is beneficial. And he'll also introduce you to um, our native DR service, AWS Elastic Disaster Recovery Service. And I promise I won't scroll ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Gary. All right. So when is the right time for you to implement your disaster recovery in the cloud? Actually, quick show of hands. Who here already has a disaster recovery implemented in the cloud? A few people? Yeah. Well, I've seen that with some customers. like in, I would say that the right time to implement DR in the cloud is as soon as possible. Uh, there are good things about doing that, especially in advance. It can help you to save a few, um, uh, um, it, it can help you to save a, a bit, especially because disaster recovery in the cloud does not require you to make upfront hardware investments. Uh, you don't have to uh, have secondary data center releases signed. You just start moving to the cloud. And for many customers that also work as a first entry, if you're not running your production environments in the cloud, you can start thinking about your disaster recovery in the cloud. You can keep your production environment, wherever it's running, and start experimenting AWS with your disaster recovery. Because when you're testing your DR, you're going to get a feel of how EC2 virtual machines work, how VPC work, networking, and actually, you already know how your applications work. So it's a good starting point to see how they're going to perform and behave in the cloud. One thing that I like to say is uh, migration is a disaster recovery that's not coming back. So if you can compare disaster recovery and migration, it's kind of a migration what you're doing. And if you're a customer that already have workloads running in the cloud, I would say start thinking about the disaster recovery, really important. I'm going to share a few tips on like, especially uh, multi-region or uh, cross-region, cross-AZ. Uh, you have to have your disaster recovery. Uh, show hands, who tested here disaster recovery in the past six months? Yeah, my homework for you when you go back from the conference, test it. Make sure it works. Because you're only going to know when you need it, when you need it. So make sure it's just working. A few theory behind disaster recovery. Uh, in AWS, we think about disaster recovery in three pillars. Not disaster recovery, resilience in general, in three pillars. We have high availability, that's one of the pillars. Operations, your teams need to know exactly what they need to do in case of an emergency. And this sense of continuous resiliency. And we have the disaster recovery. So those are different things. But just recovery is focused on the recovering your environment for a catastrophic large scale type of failure. Uh, could be a human situation, could be a flood in the data center, or could be like a ransomware attack, as Karen mentioned. So to create a proper disaster recovery and, um, planning, 
you need to think about two primary uh, things, RPO and RTO. Everybody here familiar with RPO and RTO? Yeah. So RPO is your recovery point objective. How much data are you willing to lose as part of the restoring out of a backup or whatever other disaster recovery situation you have? And RTO is the time it may take. So if you try to recover from a backup and it takes 10 hours, well, that's part, it's an outage that you're having during that situation. So you, the business needs to be familiar with that portion. And it's a really important point. The business is the one who defines RPO and RTO. They understand how the business impact is going to be. It's IT responsibility to honor those. So uh, make sure that you align RPOs and RTOs with your business. So AWS has multiple options to cover disaster recovery. Uh, we have AWS Backup, but today we are going to cover just Elastic Disaster Recovery, or DRS for short. Um, DRS is applicable for on-prem, hybrid, other clouds. You don't necessarily need to be running on AWS. That's one of the good features, uh, or it's the beauty of it. But uh, why DRS is a good starting point for you? Well, DRS is very flexible, reliable, and highly automated. Uh, that minimize downtime and help you to quickly recover from uh, any kind of disaster recovery situation. Why is it flexible? Because it's agent-based, you can install on anywhere that you can install an agent. Could be running on-prem infrastructure, other clouds, physical, virtual, uh, you name it. As long as it's an x86 Intel-based processor and you can install in one of the compatible operating systems, DRS is going to protect your environment. It's reliable because it's based out of a block-level replication. So that means everything the operating system is writing on the disk, DRS agent will replicate to AWS to a staging area. So it's really reliable because it's copying exactly the blocks. And that also accelerates the process when converting the machine to boot up on AWS during your disaster recovery testing or cutover. And finally, it's pretty simple to use. Uh, you can have like a sandbox. It, it doesn't disrupt your environment while testing the backups because you can have like an isolated environment. And uh, it also helps you to reduce the overall cost of your disaster recovery. The reason for that is you have a replication area where you're saving your data. When you need to test the backup, the, the recovery, you spin up the environment, test the replication works, then you terminate that environment. Your replication area is still preserved and you're only going to pay for exactly what you're using. So if your just recovery is not active, you're not paying for that. So Gary mentioned about the, the NIST framework and a few things DRS can do for you as part of this, um, the, the recovery pillar. Number one, isolation. DRS, you can define one specific AWS account to protect your environment restrict IAM users, and then you have an account that nobody has access to. So that's going to be protected. Um, and um, uh, Number two, multiple snapshots. DRS has a snapshot technology that uh, it uses, leverages EBS snapshot in the backend. Once a snapshot is taken, it's immutable. You can append a new snapshot, but you cannot change an existing snapshot. So that's really important for that. Uh, 31, you, uh, DRS covers only the recovery part. But you can integrate with EDR systems or uh, endpoint data and response systems. We have CrowdStrike and Sentinel-1 as partners who we integrate DRS with. Uh, check on AWS website on further integrations for that. Uh, and number four, because DRS is block level replication, you always have close to zero replication as long as your network permits, close to zero replication with the hot data. What happens if you have a ransomware attack? You do not want to recover the last point because it may be already compromised. So uh, DRS takes in the back end snapshots every 10 minutes, so you can recover from these 10 minutes whenever it's a safe copy to do so. So you can recover, you can minimize your RPO using that. Uh, how DRS works? Well, the process is pretty simple. Go to AWS console, go to DRS service, uh, do the setup, it's going to ask a few questions, like there's a wizard that can help you with. You download the agent, and then you install the agent in the machines you want to protect. Make sure it's fully replicated, then you run a test. If test is working good, everything is working, your work now is just to monitor the environment and make sure the replication is ongoing. Because, uh, and of course, like eventually testing uh, to make sure it's still working, like uh, I would still recommend doing testing every quarter or every six months. 
But when an incident happens, you activate the failover, and you have the option to go back once everything gets restored to your uh, whatever you're running that environment before the incident, or if you want to keep running on AWS, that's an option. So there's no lock-in in that. You can still recover back to your on-prem if you want to. Uh, yeah, uh, I mentioned that's agent-based. So it doesn't matter if it's running on VMware, other cloud providers, you're going to install an agent into any of these compatible operating systems. So as you can see, it's a wide range, like from Windows 2003. Anybody running Windows 2003 still? I mean, there's a way to protect that, but yeah. You can run on Windows 2003 up to 2022, vast majority of the CentOS and Ubuntu, Red Hat, SUSE Linux, you name it. And because it's block level replication, it doesn't really matter the database or what you're running because if the data is persisted on disk, you can copy, it's automatically going to manage your MySQL, Oracle, SQL Server, um, any applications, Oracle eBusiness Suite, SAP, uh, you name it. So it's going to copy and pretty much clone whatever you have in our on-prem environment. Well, that's my last slide. So how to get started with DRS? We do have a resilience competency partner uh, program uh, in AWS, so we have a handful of partners that are qualified to build disaster recovery projects. So just check on the QR link. You can also engage with your AWS account manager or AWS professional services. If you, you're more like a do-it-yourself, you can just open AWS console, go to DRS, there's a wizard that's going to help you on, guide you on how to set up uh, DRS. And if you want to take a training uh, before doing that, uh, there's a free training on AWS Skill Builder that's going to help you to build up your skills and you can get started with your disaster recovery planning and um, yeah. Well, that's all that I have for this session. Thank you very much, it was a pleasure. Appreciate the attention.